drop. Dropping dimes, dropping dimes. Baby Dane Dollar here, trailblazing dimes everywhere. I don't want to boast, but I'm dropping dimes from coast to coast. Dropping dimes everywhere, like I just don't care. I'm dropping dimes on the bike, on the stairs. I'm even dropping dimes on my teddy bear. Dropping dimes, dropping dimes. Hey, what's good, Maryville? This is Noah Cooper, joined by my co-host every week on the Dropping Dimes podcast, Perry Rando. How are we doing today, Perry? Well, you know what? Actually, I'm doing all right, but I had to call my insurance agency the other day just because I was playing basketball, and from all these injuries I've seen in the NBA, I had to make sure that I'd be okay. Oh, God. Because apparently basketball is just as dangerous as football. you got to make sure that you're not wearing Adidas shoes. I no, think that's the first step. Never. I think, I think we need to take James Harden, and we just got to go raid his closet, steal all his Adidas, all right? Because we saw this happen with D-Rose. We saw this now happen with Chris Tapp's Porzingis. So that's the first thing we're going to talk about right now. Uh, Chris Tapps Porzingis, he, he tore his ACL last night versus the Bucks, so a very disappointing injury for Chris Tapps. He had been having a great season before this, and it's, it's, that's just got to be a killer for the Knicks team. Well, when I, when I, like last time on the last couple of shows, I always say there's two sides to every dime, right? You like right. that? Yeah, I like that. I like that. But uh, so in this in this case, we got the player's perspective and then you have the team's perspective. So with the first perspective being Chris Tapps Porzingis, the player, you know, it sucks because, you know, he's emerging as one of the top faces in the league. He's an all-star this year. And, you know, he's really coming into his own as, you know, I got this game that's similar to Dirk Nowitzki's, but also I'm still athletic at the same time. I'm giving you the footwork. I'm giving you the buckets and whatever. Then we got the other side of the dime, and that is the team perspective uh, with the Knicks. Now, with that, honestly, there's nothing going to change because – they weren't going to win a championship. <laughs> well, yeah, at least, like, I, I saw Stephen A. Smith this morning. He said, he's like, I don't really see this as a big setback because it's not like the Knicks were even going to make the playoffs anyway. He's like, they now they can just go about their business, and they were kind of wondering if they should tank or if they should try to make a playoff push and try to trade for a couple pieces because now they got Tim Hardaway Jr. back. Well, he just got baptized last night by Giannis. <laughs> I'm going to throw that one out there first off. But now that they got him back, they were thinking maybe they might make a playoff off push but now I don't really think they have to worry I think now and you already saw with the Willie Heron Gomez trade they're, they're trying to get a couple draft picks and they're trying to move towards the future well I think they just need to first show some stability in their front office after what happened with Phil Jackson last year it's just a lot of stuff going on you, you know you don't know who's going to be the coach next if they're going to be doing okay in the front office just stuff like that I feel like they got to show some stability in, in the front office to begin with before you're going to start attracting some players that's going to play with Chris Osborne Zingas. And then also, I think the injury might scare away some of the uh, other free agents just because whenever someone tears an ACL, they don't come back the same. But one of your boys, Derek Rose, he didn't come back the same. Man, don't remind me. It just happens like that. Uh, Baron Davis, when he was with the Knicks, he tore his ACL and, and he didn't, he, I think he retired after that. Yeah, he was never the same after that. Right. So I think just. Uh, you know, that injury itself, that specific injury really scares away for your agents. Yeah, for sure. And especially since Chris Tapps is so young, too. Derrick Rose was so young, too. And he, you saw he kind of lost that athleticism that he had. And Chris Tapps is a pretty athletic dude. Now, albeit he's seven foot three, I, I think he'll be all right in the end. You know, he can, he can start to develop um, a post game. And he, he can maybe lose a little bit of that athleticism, but if he's if he still has that post game and he still has the ability to rebound the basketball, he's going to be all right. But I mean, this is a career this is a career year for Chris Stapps. Twenty three points a game, seven rebounds a game, leading the league in blocks at two point five blocks a game, and making your first All Star appearance. I think you're definitely right. It may scare away some free agents. And you would, you know at this point in his career, I saw All Star earlier today. At this point in his career, he's made more threes than Reggie Miller at the, at their at these points of their two careers and he has more blocks than Dwight Howard at this point of his career so He's I such just a versatile player exactly so I you know he'll be okay just because he he's so skilled and you know he might have some setbacks as far as like uh, stepping away from like attacking the rim on put back so hard he, he might just have to shift to you know I'm, I'm gonna try and get these little blocks but I'm not gonna be able to block it with so much authority stuff so just simple stuff like that and I know I, I know Porzingis I know his uh his trailing game whenever he's coming down the court for the Knicks that's really one of the spots that he really likes to pull up from for three so I think that's still gonna be a big strong key 
uh, of his game. But other, as far as anything else, like athleticism, he's going to take a step back. And, you know, with Derrick Rose, he didn't have a jump shot. <laughs> but Chris at, Stapps, at least Chris Stapps does. He has like, a jump shot, like, so we, he'll be okay. We saw D-Rose go from no jump shot to absolutely no jump <laughs> shot whatsoever. That thing is trash. Right. I, I see Derrick Rose, at this point in his career, he couldn't hit water if he was standing on a boat, all right? He, he couldn't hit sand if he was on the back of a camel, oh. okay? He can't hit anything at oh, this point man. in his career. I it's, hope he's not listening. It's depressing. I'm sorry, D-Rose. I just want to let you know, <laughs> if you are listening, that I am your biggest fan. But, <laughs> but you got to work on your jump shot, man. That that thing is rough. It, see, back to Chris Stapps Porzingis a little bit. Let's get away from D-Rose. I, I've, had, I've had enough depression for one podcast. But back to Chris Stapps. At least this gives a chance for the Knicks to play some of their younger guys. I had written here, uh, this will give Ron Baker some more minutes, opportunities. This will give Doug McDermott some more opportunities. And I even had Willie Heron Gomez in here for some more opportunities. But now, as we already see, he got traded. I think when I was writing his name down, I got the notification on my phone right away. So he, he won't be on the Knicks anymore. But at least they're going to get a couple draft picks. And I think this really sets up the Knicks well for the future because you'll get guys like Frankie Smokes out there playing some more. And you'll just get the young guys some more minutes and it could kind of be a blessing in disguise kind of like the Gordon Hayward injury they got Tatum and Brown and Smart and Rozier they got all those guys more minutes which they needed and now when Gordon Hayward comes back the Celtics will probably be better than ever so I'm hoping the Knicks you know I'm thinking the Knicks they might be they might be kind of in the same boat there as the Celtics well I'm I'm sure that they appreciate your optimistic view but as far as what I can see absolutely not they're not going anywhere but like you said uh, maybe maybe in a couple years. Anyway. Absolutely we're, not. We're looking down the road, all right? Absolutely hey, not. Get Joakim Noah's contract out of there. They might do something. Hey, look, their role players will have to step up. But I really think that for someone like Tim Hardaway, who got baptized last <laughs> night, this will be his his uh, time to really step into like the player that he really shows that he wants to be, takes, the, takes most of the shots other than Porzingis. And... Um, also, with a couple of their other players, I heard that they were shopping Courtney Lee and Kyle Quinn. So they're, shop, they're shopping around. Kyle Quinn too. Yep, they're Dang, shopping. They're gonna have no big man <laughs> left after this. They're gonna run all guards. They're not, not even caring. And I think they're okay they're with going that. They're full Cleveland Cavaliers. So I was watching the Cavs last night. All right, they had a lineup out there of Jeff Green, uh, J.R. Smith, Kyle Korver, Dwayne Wade, and LeBron James. Now, by my eyes, they're playing four shooting guards and a small forward. You know, no wonder that's not working out there in Cleveland. I mean, they have they have size in Cleveland. You know, that's LeBron is he's six nine, but he's big. It's a big six <laughs> nine. That's true, but yeah. those other guys out there, that's that's an iffy lineup they got. I mean, like they they're able to stretch the floor, and I think that's what they really want to do. Even though that they're not the, like Warriors type stretching the floor, they they really like to stretch the floor in Cleveland. But, you know, that's not working either. So, <laughs> Well, back to the Knicks just one little bit. We're going to talk about them just a little more here. Uh, a player that a player whose name we haven't thrown out yet that's going to greatly benefit from the injury, I'm assuming, would be a guy like Ennis Cantor because you already see he's having a career year after leaving Oklahoma City, after leaving Russell Westbrook. And he's averaging over 10 rebounds a game. And I'm assuming that now he, he's got the opportunity to grab, you know, some of the seven rebounds that Chris Stapps was pulling down a game, too. And don't be surprised if he becomes an all-star now that Porzingis is hurt. You know, he had a couple 2020 games earlier this season. But, you know, he would, if he does get the spot, he would be on LeBron's team. He said that he does, he, if he gets on that team, he would like to be traded. So, <laughs> you know, he's a funny guy. But I think uh, don't be surprised if he becomes an all-star. I wouldn't pick him as an all-star, honestly, in my opinion. I would still go with Ben Simmons. But I feel like the league really doesn't want to do that for Ben Simmons just because he is a rookie. This is his first year in the NBA. He's not a true rookie. But – this is first year in the NBA. They really want to kind of shy away from, you know, giving that to him, even though, you know, he might be deserving of it, but they want to give that, like, that that nod to him just because that'll be a rookie being an all-star yeah, game. Yeah, it's so hard to make the all-star team as a rookie. Yeah. I, uh, what was the last one? Blake Griffin, I'm guessing. I think so. Yeah, well, I know when Blake Griffin did it, it was, like, unheard of by that time. They're like, wow, this hasn't happened in, you know, th- 30 years. You know, like, this is crazy, a rookie making the all-star team. And obviously Ben Simmons wouldn't have made it originally, but I kind of think he has to be the front-runner. I don't really see any other person in my mind. Like, I mean, maybe you could 
throw in a name, some guy like Kemba Walker in there because Kemba Walker, he's still getting buckets out there in Charlotte. I know they're sitting about six games under 500, but Kemba Walker's still putting up 22 and four. You know, he's still doing his thing out there. And I saw an interesting stat um, out of Charlotte, and it said that uh, Kemba Walker, he's he's top ten in the NBA in plus minus. And Charlotte is near the bottom of the league overall as a team in plus minus. So that just shows that his contribution when he's not on the court compared to when he is on the court is just astronomically better when he's playing out there for the Hornets. And, you know, someone like Kim Walker is contributing so much to a team that's not doing so well. I think uh, I think you said last week that Adam Silver is in control of yeah, who, who yeah, picks Adam that. Silver, yeah, for the listeners that don't know, Adam Silver is the one that picks it. The coaches do pick the reserves, but Adam Silver is the one that decides – Um, which players make it in if there is an injury and I think with winning being a factor in uh, you know in deciding who's going to be the replacement I I think I feel like that's the only reason why Kimball Walker wouldn't be a reserve in the first place even without injuries I feel like he I feel like he really deserves to be an all-star reserve but since his team is not doing so well he's not going to make it uh, on the right like on the first try so you know Maybe the second try, I doubt it just because I feel like Adam Silver might go with a team that's higher than them, a, a player off, off a team that's higher than them. But, you know, Kemba Walker, he's out there getting buckets. He likes to do a little shimmy after he shoots them <laughs> shots. So he definitely bring the entertainment to the All-Star that's game. A, that's a UConn legend right there, all right? We never want to forget about Cardiac Kemba, all right? <laughs> so maybe maybe he'll get the opportunity to not only play with LeBron on the All-Star team, but also on the Cleveland Cavaliers as a whole. Do you see them possibly targeting Kemba Walker here in the trade deadline? I know. I know it's only less than 24 hours from the trade deadline, so if they want to make a move, it has to be quick. Well, the Cavs are really holding on to that uh, first-round draft pick from the Nets, and they look they seem like they really don't want to give that up. And I feel like that's what's scaring teams away from trading with the Cavs just because they really want that first-round draft pick. But the Cavs, you know, that's the only thing that's keeping them from keeping LeBron, to be honest. Yeah, well, it's really looming over their head. And right. that, that pick isn't going to be as good as what we originally thought. Now you see the Nets – I think they have the ninth worst record in the league, so you know we're 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 averaging we're estimating somewhere around the seven to ten pick probably the way the ping pong balls fall, but I mean that's really the only thing they got. If LeBron leaves during the off season, do they really want no assets moving forward because they're not going to have any great draft picks this season, and no one's really want to go to. No one is going to want to go to the Cavs if LeBron's not on the team. So you can see the front office. They're trying to hold on to that draft pick as long as they can. And I really believe that someone like Dan Gilbert really doesn't give a rat's patoot about <laughs> LeBron James just because that man wants to sell the team. Right, because by this time, I feel, like, either. I feel like if you want to really keep LeBron, you could have made this move a long time ago and probably get a valuable piece that can help you get over this nub that you're really struggling in. And I feel like, um, you know, he just like, you know, well, hopefully we get a great player in the draft and keep some of our nucleus like Isaiah Thomas. Maybe he wants to stay. Maybe Kevin Love doesn't have anywhere else they to don't go. Even want him. Exactly. So, you know, Dan Gilbert, he's shown to me that, you know, I don't care about LeBron James. I'm just I'm trying to get out of here just <laughs> like him. So. so I'm trying to buy the Pistons. I don't care about the Cavs no more. You know, but the Cavs, they got they got a lot going on over there. Dan Gilbert and LeBron James are right now as we speak they probably already purchased their first uh they probably already purchased their first class tickets straight out of cleveland they might have had they might have purchased them a year ago they're specifically waiting for the summer so they can get the heck out of there so we would we, we wouldn't be surprised if we saw lebron on someone like the lakers over next season or something but something something um interesting about the Cavs is right now what if with all the salaries they got they're 35 million dollars over the cap and they're paying a $43.1 million luxury tax this season. So even if they added someone like, let's say, Tyreek Evans on their team, who only makes $3.3 million, the luxury tax from that is going to go up from $43 million to $57 million for the Cavs. So even if they add Tyreek Evans, I don't really think that's someone Dan Gilbert's wanna, going to want to add for $14 million more million. Well, definitely. Could be just because I mean, Tyreek Evans is not a great investment. He's more of a, I'm going to add this piece to my nucleus. I feel like Dan Gilbert wants to move towards the future. 
and that's why they're keeping that uh, first round draft pick. So with someone like Tyreek Evans, I don't really see him fitting on that Cavaliers team. I feel like he'll fit more on like a Celtics team that we've talked before, even though I don't like him going there either. But um, you know, Grizzlies are really shopping him around, and they're not even playing him right now. They're exactly, they're just, they're just letting him go. Like, you know, let's see, let's see who's the buyers out there or best offer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, we see the, we see the. It seems like the Celtics might be a front runner right now. You thought they might be able to um, sign Greg Monroe, and they did. And now you're hearing uh, Tyreek Evans is another name um, out there, and you also hear the Heat as an option that he could go to, and also you're hearing is the Nuggets as another option that he could go to. What do you think about those, Perry? Well, I saw um, Tyreek Evans on Craigslist the other day, <laughs> and I, I just saw that you know they're willing to give him up for almost anything, just because they they're trying to move forward and they really don't see Tyreek Evans. Yeah, and he's having a great year too, twenty points a game. Like they're they're like, get this man out of here. We're trying to tank. I like, think I we think need twenty more points out here. Right. I think the Grizzlies are trying to blow it up just because Mike Conley went down and earlier this year we saw Dave Fisdale get fired. So I just really think they're trying to blow it up and try to find a different style of basketball that they can play now that Zach Randolph is also gone. And it's just Marcus Gasol there just getting buckets on his own. Yeah, Marcus Gasol's still having a great year, and that's a guy that no one really talks about right now. But he's still having a pretty he's still having a pretty good year in Memphis. He's really having an all star type of season. It's just that their record is so bad that he's he's not even close to being in the consideration for that. Exactly. And you know, honestly he probably could be an all star, but they're just so low that, you know, like we talked about earlier, he's not going to be an all-star just because that winning factor plays so much of a part, especially being in the West just because there's other great fours like DeMarcus Cousins, Anthony Davis, just those guys that are above Marcus Gasol, which Marcus Gasol usually makes it as a reserve. But, you know, they're not winning, so this is not his, this is not a year to be an all-star for someone like Marcus Gasol. But, you know, the Grizzlies, they're, they're trying to rebuild, and hopefully they can hopefully uh, trade Tyreek Evans for some draft picks to uh, try to go, uh, look towards the future just because, you know, they, they just want anything for him. Well, I mean, if you can get a first-round draft pick out of Nikola Miritich, and especially a draft pick that's probably going to be around the 14 to 17 range, um, I'm assuming you can at least get that for Tyreek Evans, too, and that's probably what they're going to be looking for. And at least, I'm, I'm assuming at least one or two young guys to go along with him, too. I wouldn't be surprised if Tyreek Evans signs with the Nuggets just because I feel like the Nuggets are really trying to shop Emmanuel Moutier. And, I, yep. you know, they kind of guard heavy. They have, uh, I'm trying to think, Gary Harris, um, Will Barton, just guys like those that they're really sticking with. And Emmanuel Moutier doesn't really play that much from the couple games that I've seen from the Nuggets. So No, he started out to a lot at the beginning of the year, and mm-hmm. he's really lost a lot of his minutes right. to go to those guys that you mentioned. Right. So, you know, I really I, I feel like, you know, Tyreek Evans, he's a swing man. So he doesn't really fit into, like, that guard spot, which he can bring the ball up, but he's more of a kind of a three. So I wouldn't be surprised if Tyreek Evans goes to the Nuggets in exchange for uh, Emmanuel Moutier. Yeah, and they've got plenty of assets on the Nuggets, too. They definitely have a lot of pieces to trade, and they've kept their draft picks for a couple years now. So, they, I mean, they got a lot to be trading for someone like him. So we're kind of going to move forward a little bit. Uh, we're going to talk about the Wizards just for a little bit here. Um, John Wall, he went out. Um, he had knee surgery. And ever since he went out, they've won five of their last six games. They're kind of on a roll right now. What do you think about that? Well, to say that the Wizards are uh, better without John Wall, that's that's tomfoolery. <laughs> so if anyone says that, they should be smacked. Got a little Patrick honest. Ewing theory going around, yeah. going around here. It, it's, it's silly for someone to think of that. But, you know, him playing injured has not helped as either. So... With Bradley Beal leading the way, I, I do really I agree with his comment. I feel like he didn't word it the right way, but I do agree with his comment saying that it kind of opens up the floor for more shots for guys because John Wall's more of an attacking guard who drives and he really most of the time finishes on his own, and and then other times he'll get uh, the assist, but usually he takes the. I would say majority of the shots, but he does take a bulk of the shots, and at times guys will feel uninvolved. Yeah, well, did you hear what Gortat said today? Mm -mm. Well, Gortat, he was bashing Wall, and he said he feels like Wall holds the ball too long. So Wall went on SportsCenter about, I want to say, like three hours ago, and he responded. He said, quote, it's funny hearing from him because he gets the most assists from me, the most spoon-fed baskets ever, end quote. 
What and, do you think about that? And right you there? know, John Wall, he's not telling a he's not telling a lie. He's not telling a lie. Gortat cannot get that ball and put <laughs> the ball in the basket on his own. It's a pick and roll, and you put that ball in this the basket. This thirty-six year old dude, he's he can't score. Like I don't that know anymore. how he keeps keeps on growing that mohawk. <laughs> it's I'm confused. Like you got to stop, Gortat. <laughs> We're reaching out to you right now. But I really Go to the barber. I you know I I said it like if they win games without John Wall, I feel like they'll blow it up and. Now that we're hearing these comments even more, I really am positive that they're going to end up blowing it up at the end of the season because no one expects the Wizards to beat one of these top-tier teams like the Celtics, Raptors. I don't want to say Cavs, <laughs> but no one really expects for them to win anything this year. So I do feel like going forward, they're going to blow it up just because there's a lot of friction going on in Washington. Yeah, and Beal, I said this last week. I said maybe we can see moving forward. Maybe he might be coming into his own, and he really has. You know, 22 points, six rebounds, seven assists, one and a half steals a game since uh, Wall went out. So those are some big-time numbers for Beal from, you know, a first-time All-Star in Beal. And he's shooting the ball well, too, so he's really doing everything that the Wizards want for him. And he had a 50-point game earlier this season. So Correct. that just flashes like that while Wall's out. Yeah, so it's the and Wizards. A, and a 40-point game, like, you know, right immediately when Wall went out, too. So... It just shows the wiz like the Wizards front office. You know, this is a guy that we can keep going forward. You know, we can trust that he's going to lead us to the promised land. And all we need to do is keep pieces like Otto Porter around him to help him keep on producing. Yeah, I really like how Beal has developed his game and has really took a step forward since Wall went out with an injury. So that'll be it for this week on the Dropping Dimes podcast. If you want to check out more, uh, listen tomorrow as we discuss. What went down after the Blake Griffin trade, you know, how the Pistons and Clippers are both looking. And we're also going to be discussing the trade deadline. So the trade deadline is at 3 p.m. Eastern time tomorrow. And our show is from 4 to 6. So we're going to be discussing everything that just went down from the trade deadline, whether it's going to be a quiet trade deadline or whether there's going to be a lot of trades going on. So if you want to hear more of that, listen from 4 to 6 tomorrow, Thursday, for Perry Randall, I'm Noah Cooper, and on the Dropping Dimes podcast, we out. Dropping Dimes, Dropping Dimes. Dropping Dimes, Dropping Dimes.